Hello, welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Paul Humphrey from BMLL. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Toby. How are you? Really good, Paul. Really good. Listen, it's lovely to see you. Um, it's, well, it's only been a couple of months since we last bumped into each other. Very different circumstances then to now. You uh, you surviving? <laughs> I am, um, like many others. Um, certainly night and day away from where we met. Um, certainly early on in the year, who could have seen all this? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't something we were talking about too much at that sort of stage. But to give a, a little bit of context, look, it's been a, a fascinating year for you. So sort of join a, a, a great business uh, as the CEO in, in, in January. Um, and then all this sort of comes up. Tell us a little bit more. Tell us a little bit about BMLL, first and foremost. And then, then what really excited you to take on this, and this amazing role that you're doing at the moment? So my good friend and ex-boss, Lee Hodgkinson, joined as the chairman of BMLL in August of last year. And at the time he said to me, Paul, you know, you remember BMLL from um, our time at Euronex, of course. So I've joined as chairman. I was fascinated to hear about that. And he said, actually, there may be an opportunity. I'd like you to come and join me on the board as an advisor. Um, a couple of weeks later, Lee phoned me back. He said, um, actually, forget that idea. How would you potentially like to join the CEO um, for the beginning of the new year? Um, the board are ambitious. They want to scale up the business. And um, I think, I think it would be great for you. you know, every business you've run in the past, You've always been a, a scale-up person within large organizations. Um, I think you'd really enjoy it. So we started talking. I met the board. Um, and I spent quite a bit of time with them in November and December, but formally started in January, and that's when it got announced. And it's been, uh, it's been, it's been interesting since. Tell us a little bit about how you've, uh, how you've been dealing with it all. Yeah, I think my first 100-day book is going to be an interesting one. Um, <laughs> there, there is, there, there's, there's a book that's going to be released on this, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. So, um, look, we, I came into, uh, first of all, I came into the business in, in January of this year. Um, what was very clear to me, and certainly was my time at Euronex, um, BMLL had, has got an amazing team with an extraordinary capability. Um, however, when you looked at the messaging and the way we communicated that via our website, it was hard to actually put your finger on what the product was. Mm. Um, you certainly understood the capability. Everyone knew the team was smart um, and what they did. So we said about really in the early stages, productizing the business and getting our messaging right. That was key. Um, if you were a bank that was in an alpha generating seat, you wanted to look at our website, see what's applicable for you. If you were in an exchange and you are monitoring yields, volumes, um, you don't want to look at a website that's telling you about alpha generation of it, you'll switch off. So it's got to talk directly to the person who's going to use the service. Um, and that we set about doing um, the rebranding exercise, getting our new website out, which we've done now. We're really proud of that. Um, mm, it's great. And we, uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, it, um, a lot of hard work went into that. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, we're doing the same program at the moment. So that's my one o'clock call to, uh, to do that. And it's, uh, <laughs> I, I, I feel your pain. I feel your pain. So, so you, you've been positioning all of that. You've got this great team, team in, in, in place. Um, the last 13 weeks have been challenging for every CEO, let alone, let alone a new one. Uh, tell us how you've navigated uh, a lockdown and some of the things that you guys have been doing to uh, to keep everyone, you know, safe and well and, and and happy and thriving. Absolutely. So I joined. Our office was in Victoria when when I joined, and I joined knowing that the entire building was going to be emptied for redevelopment, um, certainly by the beginning of March. So we'd already began uh, the process of finding a new building in St James's. Um, which we did. We went through all the fit out of that and the negotiation of lease. And of course, this was happening at the same time. I'm getting to know the business. I'm getting to know the clients. I've got a great team. I'm getting to know them. But at the same time, we're talking about moving into a new office, getting the fit out of that right and everything. We did all of that in February. Um, so you can imagine we were busy for those first two months. It was crazy. <laughs> 
in the back of my mind, I say in the back of my mind, it's not true, um, forefront of my mind, um, obviously we had this situation of COVID unfolding. Um, I've actually got a son with one lung and um, uh, we were always concerned about what this would mean um, should the situation escalate. So my wife was actually saying to me, have you got a plan? Have you got a plan for COVID? What are you going to do? Now, actually, we were early. At the beginning of February, um, we have a fantastic lady that works with us um, who heads our HR. I want a plan. I want to know exactly what we're doing. So if we're going to navigate this, we're going to empty the office, we're going to empty the office quickly, and we're going to be ahead of the curve, hopefully, um, if this situation starts to worsen. So situation did. We had in place a plan. We moved into our new offices at the beginning of March. We had, I think, precisely seven working days in this wonderful new surrounding. <laughs> and then I moved everybody out. Yeah, yeah. Um, the situation was clearly starting um, to escalate. So about a week prior to the official lockdown, um, I made sure that we had all the remote capabilities to work from home and I moved everybody home. Yeah. And then it, um, obviously we got the announcement from the government on, on the formal lockdown and we were already in situ. But yeah, <laughs> not the, was uh, that? <laughs> um, well, I mean, from a systems perspective, my, my team did a fantastic job. Um, we, we didn't miss a, a second of downtime with our clients. Um, we are a cloud native business anyway um so uh, all my staff could uh, could access remotely we kept everything alive we kept the growth going um so we moved home and uh yeah like many others um spending my entire life on zoom um you know, frankly, <laughs> I, I, I always felt as, as, as i used to say when i was a broker many years ago i always felt i had a better place for radio frankly <laughs> Now I find myself on TV a lot. <laughs> well, the beard, the beard suits you, so you're fine now, aren't you? That's the... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's that, that's made your that's made your box office. So so we're, so we're fine with it. <laughs> Only problem is, is we have to look at your Arsenal shirts in the background. <laughs> Can't help everything. Yes. yes. At least I'm, last night I reminded myself what it feels like to be an a miserable <laughs> Arsenal fan. I missed that feeling. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me of it. <laughs> I try. I try. I try. So, so, um, so tell us how the team have been doing then. So, so you, you, you were ahead of the curve. You move into the, to the, uh, uh, to home offices. You've got a team there that are, that are doing that. We've all gone through challenges and, and, and successes and highs and lows through that. How have you guys got on with it all? Um, I think we've coped with it really well. Um, I mean, there's an enormous change, um, for my team. Um, I'm a demonstrative leader. I like to be around, um, my team so one of the things we did um immediately was we had a zoom meeting booked eight o'clock every morning with the management team every day and we wrap our day up at 5 5 30 every evening i think that uniformity to the team uh, and to our day really did help because i think mm. people need a routine so we saw each other every day. It wasn't a call. You know, we were up, we were showered, we were washed, we were dressed, we were on TV. Um, then throughout the day, I'll come on to customers, interacting with those, of course. Um, and then we would hold um, a Zoom meeting every Friday for the entire team. There's, you know, just under 50 of us. Um, we would, you know, I would tell the team all the things that we've been going on with through the week. During that week, I would have separate meetings with various parts of the technology business um, to ensure everyone's okay. Um, it's hard. You've got to put mm. the effort in. Um, yeah. And it's, it's not been entirely easy, but I have to say, I think we've done a cracking job. And I'm really proud of the team. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I've been leading this team now longer in lockdown than I was physically. <laughs> How funny is that? It's incredible. Yeah, I know. It's amazing, yeah. really. And uh, yeah. the loyalty and the drive and support I've managed to foster in a, uh, in a short period of time, I mean, testimony to the team. They've been amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. 
Yeah, well, look, I'm, I'm sure they think exactly the same of you from uh, from what from what I've been hearing so far. So <laughs> it's a, a, a good mix. So look, the internal side of things going well, and I love that sort of that sort of continuity. I think it's important that we've been doing very similar sort of things ourselves. That communication, I think, is is absolutely essential. Tell us about the client side. How have you? How have you? Yeah, that, that's, it's so so important, and and that sort of continuity is really important to how you go. How how you, how you've been managing there? So, of course, I started in January, reaching out to our existing clients, getting meetings booked with those. That was all fine. Um, then reaching out to a wider group of prospective people, many that have been in my network um, for many years, more than I care to mention. Um, <laughs> started, reaching, started reaching out to them. And then, of course, lockdown happens. Now, I think so some of the customers that were running large venues, um, and notwithstanding, of course, we had enormous volumes in March to go with this. So yeah. not only were um, those running venues um, being moved to work remotely, they then had the issue, you know, can, can all our customers log in? Has everyone got remote access? Is everything okay? At the same time, you've watched this surge of volumes. I mean, to give you some idea, typically in Europe, we gather... Uh, all of the equity data across the mainnet exchanges, uh, all of the MTFs and the darks. And we see typically 80 to 90 billion euros a day of volume. During this period of March, it was going up to 170, 180, 200 at one point. So the venues themselves, right, first things first, can customers actually log in? Are all the remotes happening? Can people VPN? Uh, that's fine. Once that was fine, it was, right, don't touch anything. <laughs> it's all working. Don't, for God's sake, touch anything. Um, then, of course, that started to loosen up a little bit in early January. So March was a testing time in actually getting people's attention. But I've got to say, we were quite successful. Um, we signed up a new client at the beginning of April, which was testimony to the work we've been done. Um, a couple of our clients um, switched from proof of concept to long-term contracts in March, which was absolutely fantastic and a, a great vote of confidence in the business. Um, yeah. So that was that was all good, um, but it was it was challenging times, that's for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. and it still continues to go. Well, what, with regards to that, and, and you know the market and, and everything that's challenging, what's what's your sort of view? What's the BMLL take on the uh, on the marketplace as a whole at the moment? So once that moment, you know, once March went through, um, clearly a lot of a lot of firms are uh, refocused on their growth. So once they were confident everyone was working, they wanted to make sure that they had their growth strategies in place or, or any new initiatives they were looking at, and we were included in that. So we found ourselves on a lot of calls and a lot of interaction with clients, which was great. There was. I would say I noticed a little bit of a separation between the buy and sell side, if you like. Um, the sell side very much seemed to be in disaster recovery mode, split teams, working from offices, um, having A team, B team, you know, as, as to make sure that they were, uh, could continue the business. In fact, some of them actually splitting those teams and working from uh, disaster recovery sites. Um, the buy side, it would appear very much went home um, and working from home, which has been, uh, again, easy, easy to interact with um, and doesn't seem like they're moving back quite so soon. Um, yeah. One of the things I've noticed is some of the buy side, um, whereas they normally operate with, you know, four to six monitors around them when they're in the office, um, now, often or not, are working off a laptop or a couple of screens, which means for many of the venues, uh, actually getting information in front of the client is actually challenging. I mean, yeah. screen real estate, I think, was red hot anyway. Um, I think it's gone white hot now. Mm. Um, so actually, for businesses like ours that provide insight and analytics, actually it's helpful to many businesses because you can get those insights onto the screen, people can see them um, and, and they can react upon them. So it's, it's actually benefiting us, I have to say. 
Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's one of those difficult things, isn't it? It's uh, there's a. Uh, I'm speaking to so many people there who who I know don't want to. Um, you know, it, know it's crass to sort of be too triumphant at at, the, you know, at at times like this. But what I think it is, is is and what we've tried to do all the way through this process is to sort of see businesses and share stories of people turning negatives into positives. And I think you know when when you've got a a product there that that can add add real value to it. It's important to you know to sort of show how this can you know can be somewhere where people can adapt and pivot and add value to you know to the marketplace. Tell us a little a little bit about the developments within within you guys. Look, it's 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 going well, which I'm delighted about. Tell us about the, the, the you know what what's uh, what's coming next and what's down the track for for BMNL. Sure, of course. Um, so I mean, you know, notwithstanding COVID has had its challenges, certain things we would have liked to accelerate faster. Um, under normal circumstances, might have done them. They've been slowed up somewhat. Um, on saying that, we've been building our collaboration network. I think it's vital that um, uh, we see BMLL as a service that augments many others. Um, so ensuring that we're interoperable within the community is something that, um, within the FinTech community, certainly, is something that's of paramount importance to me. We've recently signed a collaboration agreement with OpenFin. Um, yeah. That's going to be an interesting one. We built uh, Plato Metrics on behalf of the Plato Partnership, and that went live in December. And I have to say that was a game changer for BMLL. I mean, up until then, you know, we've got our um, data and analytics product that was embedded in a you know, Python native research sandbox platform, which one would have to be a Python native quant uh, to access. Funny enough, I'm not one of those. And as I explained, <laughs> and as I explained to um, um, all my data scientists internally, and you know, we nicknamed them the wizards. Um, <laughs> the wizards love speaking to other wizards um, who absolutely get the service, understand what we've built and the power of it, and that's great. The one thing I've explained to the wizards is that it's unfortunate but it's the muggles who own the checkbooks when it comes to buying these services, right? Yeah. So you need to explain what we do in a salient way that business leaders understand. Yeah. So when Plato Metrics came along and it brought to life the visualization of what we've got underneath in this platform, it was like, um, it, it, it was a savior moment. Ah, that's what you do. Ah, now <laughs> I can see it. Now it's come to life. So that, visualization of our underlying data um, yeah. is vital so we're going to build out more of this um, Plato partnership in case you don't know is 35 of the world's largest banks and buy side who commissioned us to build Plato metrics which we're incredibly proud of but there's lots of um, follow-on and upsell opportunities from that as those as that group starts to ask, actually, can we get an API from that that feeds into my um, in-house stack? Can I upload my portfolio to that? Um, can I take a white labeled version of that and offer it out to my customer? So the answer to all those questions is yes. Um, they're just upsell opportunities that we're busy working through right now. So it's really exciting. So that getting that live um, was a game changer for us. And yeah. the other part of it is, together with the Plato partnership, we designed um, the historic curve of the European best bid, best offer across lit venues, dark venues, um, um, and all the addressable and non-addressable liqu uh, liquidity in Europe. Um, recently, there's been some fantastic um, articles written on this. Um, Euronext wrote a an amazing white paper on um, why they believe that the, the consolidated tape with all the insights that's required should be one that's a historic uh, tape. Um, recently, there was a response, um, a MIFID II response from the World Federation of Exchanges. Um, they said the same thing. So um, we seem to be, um, we seem to be well, well placed for that, which is great. Yeah, yeah, well, it's a, it's a, you know, strategy obviously puts you in the right positions for for these sort of things, and it seems like it's a you know business that's that's very well positioned for the long term and and navigating through 
everything that we're dealing with at the moment, but also what happens there, there afterwards. And it's great to see that. Speaking of the, of the, of the long term and, and the sort of, you know, how this and everything the industry has been going through, what's your sort of uh, crystal ball here? What, how, how are you looking at things and uh, thinking the impact long term of, of, of lockdown and COVID will be? Um, without a doubt, I mean, the expression people are coining is going to be a new normal, isn't there? Um, <laughs> one thing that, um, and I actually think financial services have been behind the curve as an industry when it comes to thinking about flexible working, working from home. I mean, my generation, right? what we were really good at is we turned up no matter what. It didn't matter what a hangover was, whatever. We turned <laughs> up for work every day. Um, actually, in this environment, I think it's taught us a lot of lessons. I mean, you heard Zuckerberg the other day turn around and say, you know, 50% of my staff will return to the offices. I'm going to provide for flexible working and I'm going to hire from the regions um, and pay accordingly. Uh, so actually yeah. deep, dig into a wider pool of talent. On that note, when I inherited the team, one of our lead developers, and he's a, he's a complete rock star, is based in Edinburgh and he runs, you know, almost half of my development team. So I've like teamed with about 15, 16 people. And when I turned up, I was like, does that work? Uh, you know, this guy being in Edinburgh? Oh, yeah, yeah, If he was in London, Paul, um, one, he'd cost us more, he's a rock star, and two, um, it worked. And actually, of course, during this period, you realise well, he's on Zoom, he's no more remote than any of us. Yeah, so yeah. then it gets you thinking, actually, he's based in Edinburgh. Um, fantastic Comsci University in Edinburgh. Could we be putting talent around him there? And then you take that thought one step further. Actually, do I need to be having people physically located in the offices um, in terms of the development staff? So I do think there will be a new normal. Um, also, I think about the efficiency of the day, the traveling to and from work. Um, I see there being a blend. There's no doubt that we will return to offices um, and you know, spend time with our teams and with our clients. But visiting clients is going to be a challenge. Um, you, like me, have been in, you know, been in some of the world's largest organizations. Navigating their uh, reception areas has not been easy over the last few years anyway. Um, yeah. Add COVID to it, it's going to be, um, it's going to be very difficult. Um, yeah. So I think meaning, meetings will become more meaningful when you have them, which I think would yeah. be great. They'll be scheduled um, and planned in advance. And I think you'll basket those together. And then um, you'll maybe have a bit more flexible time uh, working from home, being efficient, getting more done during the course of the day. So I definitely think there'll be a new normal. And I think it's uh, for industry leaders to think about how we embrace that and get the best out of it. Because actually it may open us up to a much wider talent pool. There's a there's a very interesting sort of tweet that came up from Alan Sugar uh, yesterday that sort of created a bit of a storm and I sort of uh, shared it shared it on LinkedIn which was uh, uh, him basically saying we need to get people back into offices and you're going to miss the uh, sort of uh, you know effectively the water cooler chats and how many uh, important questions and how it's impacting productivity. Look, you 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 uh, intimated it beforehand like me. We we turned up. I think has always been my sort of thing. It, it would take. Uh, you know, hospitalization to keep me away from the office to, you know, on, on, a, on, a, on a sit there or anything like that and I get that and it's and you know I've, I've, I've been for 20 years a complete five day a week uh, you know kind of kind of guy we're now starting to look at things where where flexibility I think is going to be inevitable um, and getting that sort of things right but without that you know with with you in a business that's you know will be in growth mode and bringing people in at various different stages both at a senior level which I think is more straightforward but also a junior level how do you how do you ensure that people sort of uh, don't don't lose that learning by osmosis when they, you know they might have forty percent of the time that they were in the office beforehand in the office? You've got to make sure you get the blend right um, because that's what and that's why I do think there will be a hybrid of the two. You need that physical time. People need it. We as human beings need it. Um, yeah. So there will be time for that interaction. Also, when I think about, I mean, my job, my roles over the years have had, had me flying all over the world for, for, for many years. And there was always something impersonal about a video conference call when I was having it from the office. It's really yeah. strange. 
I didn't enjoy it. You're sitting there, stiff neck, um, having a video conference call. So you know what? I would get on the plane and go to Asia and go to, uh, go to the US. It's different in this environment. Um, yeah. it, I, I can't quite put my finger on it. I think it's a case of, you know, actually you know, you're inviting people into your home. Um, you're yeah. invited into theirs. And the conversation is somewhat more personal and you actually get things done. Whereas when it's a video call from the office to another office, it was very much, well, I'm having this video call because it saves me traveling. It yeah. wasn't, um, wasn't bringing anything to either side. So it, I, I don't know. I've, I've got a, um, a feeling that this has had a, a, a material change. I can't imagine, for example, getting back into the office with three or four of my management team and crowding around a black star phone speaking to a client. Why are we not going to have them? I, I fully get that we're going to have that conversation from the office, but we'll have them on video in the office in the same format yeah. that you and I are talking right now. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Can't imagine just doing that. So um, we'll see. I think there'll be a real blend. It's interesting. It's some be... of the times I'm having calls with people, and actually, it's, actually, isn't it nice just to have a call and not be on Zoom? <laughs> 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 so I, I think there'll be a blend. I think it's going to be really interesting, isn't it? And, and I, I agree with you. I think there will be a blend. I'm just sort of very fascinated about how, um, you know, whether whether we revert to type. Uh, you know, uh, I think there was a lot of uh, a lot of great humanity that was shown at the you know at the start of all of, of all this and the clapping for the NHS and all this sort of thing. And then, you know, all of a sudden, with with a few weeks worth of uh, of, of lockdown, you saw the beaches absolutely get trashed. And yeah, you know, there was all the stuff about the you know the the canals of Venice sort of starting to become clearer and the economic impact and then as soon as a bit of sunlight comes out and people are released it's this horrible sort of face of, uh, of of human nature come back and one of the things i hope is that we that we don't just uh you know we do take some of the lessons and and, and opportunities in this and, and pick that up i'm going to speak what um you know towards the end of this now with, 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 with regards to opportunity um and and you know the theme of this series has always been about positives from negatives as, as i said before Tell us some of the sort of real key positives that you think is going to make your business better, the industry better, you better uh, from it. Where, where's your thoughts on that? So uh, when it comes to what we do, we, we, we ingest huge amounts of historic data. And it's from historic data that you can truly get the insight of um, and predictability of what may happen next. I mean, as our business was aptly named by our um, founding scientists, you know, BMLL actually stands for Bayesian Machine Learning on the Limit Order Book. Right? <laughs> now, many I'm, glad wonderful that, I'm glad I didn't have to introduce you like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, many wonderful attributes, but marketing wasn't one of them. Um, <laughs> now, but the point is this, um, I think people are waking up to the fact that actually um, there's always been a clamor for pre-trade data and real-time data. It's actually being able to ingest huge quantities of historic data gives you that predictability insight going forward. And um, I think more and more people are waking up to that. And the other thing is, you know, if you look, think about the backdrop in this environment of the news that we're given on a daily basis, you know, you've got the public talking about the flattening of the curve and is there going to be spikes? Where does all this come from? It comes from the, uh, the historic data that they're gathering and collecting and whatever, and they're deriving insights to, to predict what's going to happen next. Actually, yeah. the kind of narrative we're using around um, many of the uh, products that we have today is somewhat topical, um, and it's not alien to people. So, you know, this is the third uh, data business in my career that I've had um, the pleasure of running. Um, I've run a pre-trade one, I've run a, a real-time one. Um, the historic one, there's very few firms in the world that have the capability to ingest the amount of quantity of data that we do. And being cloud native for that means that we have access to just unlimited compute power, which is extraordinary. Mm. Mm. Look, I think you've got, you know, we, we've been saying it for some time. I think your business is a, is a superb business. Um, it was superb before you arrived. I think it's going to be even better now you're there, there as well. I think that this is a, uh, one of the key things about this is, to, you know, as you know, uh, BML has been has featured a couple of times now in our most influential um, list that we do in the Financial Technologist yeah. magazine. 
and I think you know there's a reason for that. And and traditionally, when we look at what the strengths are of those businesses, it's been uh, you know the quality of the tech and the quality of the product naturally, but also the quality of the uh, of the leadership team, the group you put together. There's a um, very clearly stuff that's that's happening very very well for you for you guys, and why it's uh, why it's set up to to continue to thrive. So. Congratulations and the very best of luck with it. Uh, Paul, I know there's gonna be people who are watching this who, who wanna get in touch with you and find out a little bit more as well. What's the best way of them doing that? Um, literally my contact detail, Paul Humphrey at bmlltech.com. Um, I've got some contact details on LinkedIn. I'm an avid user there, so always send me a LinkedIn and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll always respond. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're working, you know, day and, day and night here to grow this business. Um, and we're really enjoying it as well. I have to say I'm working with a, a fantastic group of people, um, young, talented people, just extraordinary. Um, and it, it's just a privilege to lead them. I have to say it's a privilege. But it is, uh, it is, it's brilliant to see you smiling and, and look at, looking like you're enjoying that as well. It's, uh, it's, uh, apart from the football. <laughs> yeah, apart, from, apart from the football. You can't have it all, can you? <laughs> no, no. A win would have been nice. <laughs> as a Liverpool fan, I'll agree with you on that. But uh, um, yeah, look, it, it's, uh, it is, it's brilliant to see someone enjoying uh, the challenge so much. It's, it's great to see the company doing so well with it as well. Uh, and thank you so much again for popping on and sharing the story and sharing some of those learns as well. Thank you for having me. It's um, been really enjoyable. Thank you very much indeed. Good stuff. Thanks, Paul. And thanks to you all for watching. We'll see you soon on another episode of FinTech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.